John 5, verse 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know what he hears, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the decision of He then there is his will, isn't it? Because his ways aren't our ways, and... Um, he knows what we need better than what we need. So uh, we've got to make sure, even when Jesus was praying before he was arrested, and he was always asking for God's will, not his own. So just remember when we pray for stuff, and it's totally okay to do that. we just got to make sure that we ask it that it be God's will, whatever the outcome is. But he will hear us and answer us one way or the other. Let's, let's pray. All right, let's stand and say the Lord. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our debts, we forgive our debtors. We us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
was going to mention today. when he's up there because he stands over there a lot. I just move it. Yeah. And that usually takes him up. Oops, I'm sorry. Are you good? If we get, get somebody that walks around, then just try to keep him in the center. And the screen is kind of here, gradually move it. He just usually walks around like here, so it usually, that's good enough. Alright, how y'all doing this morning? Doing well. Good. Can y'all hear me? Eric, can you hear me back there? Harvey, can you hear me? We alright? Great. Okay. We got a lot of stuff to do this morning. Uh, let me see. First thing, you know, it's interesting, kind of. This is our first service back to church since we've had a revival. Mm -hmm. You know? And I don't know how you felt, but I really enjoyed that revival. Yeah. That, that gentleman, when I listened to him speak, I remember the first time I heard him speak, I thought, I don't know about all that. You know? But once you listen, or for me, once I listened to him and listened to him for a little while, uh, he had some good messages. Really good messages, I thought. Yeah. The one of the the best one, the one that I guess I enjoyed or that I felt touched by the most, or however you want to say it, was when he talked about the people that were lost, the people of Macedonia calling out of the darkness. I thought it was a really good message. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyhow, I enjoyed it. I got a blessing from it. I'm glad the man was here. I think that he would sincerely appreciate it. And we need to remember this, and we'll try to do it Wednesday night for preaching on our prayer list. His daughter, Rachel, Jeff, so we need to remember her. Get her on our prayer list and pray for her. Okay. Uh, we got visitors. Amy, do we have visitors? Would you like to? Hey, how are you? All right. And your name is? Dickie. Dickie. I'm glad you're here. Glad you came. See, uh, all of our visitors. And they, they, these people all know this. All of our visitors, first time they're here, they get to come up here and stand and sing Jesus okay. Love. <laughs> <laughs> no, we wouldn't do that to you. We wouldn't do that at all. We're glad you came. All right, anything else? Get ready to go. Anybody? All right, let's pray. We'll get started. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for allowing us to be here. And we thank you for our revival, Father. We pray that you be with that man. Just watch over him. Lead him and take care of him as he travels, does the work that you've given him to do. We just pray, Father, that you would be now with our Sunday school class here for a little bit. Just lead us through this. Have the Holy Spirit work and teach us. And just help us to understand and learn to come closer to you, learn to abide in you. We thank you and praise you for everything you've done for us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay. Let's finally turn to the book of... Uh, First Chronicles, First Chronicles, chapter number 16. First Chronicles, chapter number 16. Now, when we left here, we could pull that. And again, I apologize for this because this has kind of got away from us. Uh, it got away from me. We were talking about, remember we were talking about the book of Yashar a month or so ago, and we were talking about the books of the Apocrypha. Remember that? We were talking about the Apocrypha. That's kind of got away from us. What we were going to do, and that was last week, what we were going to do was find out what the Apocrypha was. So we'll kind of move along with this. I'll try to do better next time. Anybody know what the Apocrypha is? Besides the preacher. All right, Craig, go ahead. Uh, it's a book that contains about 15 books in it. Uh, it's written by Jesus All right, they were these books that we're talking about. This 
This Apocrypha, generally we think about it occurring between the New Testament and the Old Testament, right? That's when these books were written that you were talking about, somewhere in that ballpark. And there's, like he said, 10 or 15 of them, they're not in the Bible, okay? Craig, why are they not in the Bible? They're not inspired. They're not inspired by God. The people who put the Bible together felt that these books are not inspired by God, so they didn't include them. Now, if you ever run into these, Remember that. that. That doesn't necessarily make them bad, okay? These are good history books. They're accurate. Their accuracy is fine as far as a history book. It is not part of the Bible because they weren't inspired by God. Right? We're good? Yeah, there's actually a lot of books that are referenced to in the Bible that are not a part of our Bible. Uh, and back when COVID started, we had a question answer time, and that, that question came up a couple times. And I, it might still be on YouTube somewhere uh, where I answered that question about these extra biblical books. Because there's actually another letter to Corinthians that Paul wrote. It was actually the, the real first letter to Corinthians. But it also was not inspired. Uh, but they are considered uh, reference books. And that's why some of these books are actually in the original 1611. They were included not as part of the Bible, but they were included as a reference. Uh, in the in the original 1611. Right. So if we were if you encounter any of these books, and you might, uh, for our purposes, we would use them simply as a history book. Yeah. That's the way we would look at them. There are, you know, last year, whenever it was, we were going to do the Book of James. There are a lot of Bible scholars who believe the Book of James should have been one of these books of the Apocrypha. They believe that the book of James is not inspired by God. But that's back and forth and it's in there. So there it is. Alright? Okay, next thing. First Chronicles chapter 16, <clears throat> verse 8. Chapter 16. Let me get caught up here. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse number 8. Chapter 16, verse number 8. Okay, let's stand, please. Chapter 16, verse number 8. Let's read this together. We're going to read verse 8, 9, and 10. <coughs> Give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make man his deeds among the people, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk to him of all his wondrous works. Glory in his name, holy name, let the heart of them rejoice. Seek the Lord. Okay, thank you. You have to see. Mark in your Bible right there. Back up to chapter number 15 and put you a mark right there. Okay, we're going to get back to that in just a minute. Now take your Bible and turn to the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah, chapter number 7. The book of Jeremiah, chapter number 7. Got it? Put your mark right there. We're coming back to that in just a second. We'll be there shortly. Book of Jeremiah, chapter number 7. Now, go to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel, chapter number 6. 2 Samuel, chapter number 6. Okay? All right, here we go. Now, what we're going to talk about here for just a minute, and I want you to think about this for a second. And... Now, and I want to see what you all think about this. Okay? I want to know what you think. And this is going to seem silly when we start. All right? The reason it's going to seem silly is because it is silly. Okay? Now, keeping all that in mind, stay caught up here. All right? Don't let it, don't let it get away from you. Okay? Here we go. All right, Mike. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Okay? You go home this week, and you go to bed one night this week, and God sends the angel Gabriel to you in a vision, in a dream, whatever you want to call it, okay? While you're asleep, you with me? All right, now what the angel Gabriel says to you is, Mike, God wants you to cook supper at your house tomorrow evening. Got it? You with me? That's what Gabriel tells Mike. I want you to cook supper at your house tomorrow evening. Now, the next thing he says is, God wants you to cook meatloaf for supper. OK? 
Okay, you with me so far? Angel Gabriel, God wants you to cook meatloaf for supper tomorrow evening. All right? Now, God says, Angel Gabriel says, and by the way, Mike, God wants you to put breadcrumbs, ketchup, onions, green peppers, and hamburger in this meatloaf. You with me so far? Y'all with me so far? Okay. Now, you say, you get up the next morning and you think, oh, yeah, okay, I'm all for that. You know, I want to be obedient. I want to do what God tells me to do. I'm anxious to have the opportunity to serve. So Mike jumps in the car and goes to the grocery store to get his stuff to make this meatloaf because God asked him to. Now, remember this. His heart is in the right place. He wants to be obedient. He wants to do this. He is not only wants to do it, but he wants to do it well. He wants to do a good job here because God tells him, here's what I want you to do. Now, he goes in the grocery store. He starts picking up his stuff. He picks up uh, red crumbs, peppers, green peppers, onions, uh, ketchup. He goes back to the meat counter. There's no hamburger. All right? But right over here, they got turkey burgers. Okay? Now, this turkey burger is on sale, by the way. And he looks at it and thinks, well, that's on sale. And that's healthier than the hamburger. So I'll just get that off we go. So he gets his turkey burger, goes back to the house, fix the meatloaf. You with me? Okay. Now, Mike, is it okay with God that you bought turkey burger instead of hamburger? No. Nor Sue? No. Is it okay? No. See that? No. Okay. All right. Everybody agree with the no part? Okay. Timothy? Why is it not okay? Now, now keep in mind, he's working at this. I mean, he's trying, you know? He has no bad intentions. He's not trying to cut corners. He went over there doing the best he could with his heart in the right place. They didn't have any hamburgers, so he gets the turkey burger, and everybody here says, that's a bad idea. <laughs> Why? Say that again. Said get hamburger. Didn't say anything about turkey. Okay. God said to get hamburger. Now let's stop right here. Are we all in agreement that it's that no turkey bird? No, that's bad. Right? Everybody agree with that? We're supposed to get hamburger because he said get hamburger. All right? Now, if that's the case, did he Donald, did he when he got this turkey burger? Did he disobey God? Yes. What? What? <laughs> no, he didn't. Yes, he did. You're exactly right. Yes, he disobeyed God. Now, let's go one step further. If he disobeyed God, what is that? What's that? What are we calling it? He sinned. <laughs> now, you're telling me the man sinned because he got turkey burger instead of hamburger. Is that what you're telling me? Yes. Okay. Now, the sin was the sin of disobedience. Is that right? Right? Okay. Right. Ne what? Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> now, if it was a sin of disobedience, if he sinned, God's going to forgive him for his sin. God's faithful to forgive us. Right? But what else is going to happen? The outcome won't be the same. But, all right. Hold that. Hang on right there. You're right. But there's something else. Along with the forgiveness comes, come on, what does God do to those he loves? Chastise them. All right. If you sin, if he sin, and it's a sin of disobedience in the eyes of God, God's going to chastise him for it. Now we're talking about being chastised because the man got turkey burger instead of hamburger. All right. That's what you all are telling me here, right? Okay. All right. Now, and I agree. I'm with you. I agree 100. percent What we need to make sure, first of all, that we understand is number one, when God gives us something to do and tells us how to do it. He expects us to do it exactly right. as he tells us how to do it, right? There is no time, there is no time in your life that God's going to come to you and say, you know, just do whatever you think, right? I, I want it done, just do whatever you think, okay? That's not going to happen. And he expects complete obedience. And if we don't have that, it becomes a sin of disobedience, okay? Now, what you were talking about is, we're going to talk about that here in just a minute, because he did not obey God completely, because he sinned, all right, he's not going to receive the blessing from it that he would have if he had have done it correctly. 
right? You with me so far? Yeah. Okay. The important thing here is, and you were talking about, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. There is nothing small enough to where God is going to say that doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. All right? It does matter. It matters. If he tells you to get a hamburger, he expects hamburger. Okay? Now, one thing right quick. God is not going to send you to the grocery store to get hamburger, mm -hmm. and there not be no hamburger there. Okay? We need to remember that. If God is going to tell us to do something specifically, God will make sure that we have all the tools we need to do it. Okay? All right, what we want to look at here for a minute is what happened with David. And this is exactly what we were talking about. We're in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter number 6. And we are going to start about verse number 6. All right, look here. God decides, David decides, he is going to go get the Ark of the Covenant, which has been sitting out in the country for the last 20 years. All right? He's going to go get it and bring it to Jerusalem. All right? That's what his plan is. And this is a good plan. We're going to see here in a minute. God wants this Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem, and he wants David to take it there. Okay? So David goes and talks to the people. David believes he's in the will of God. All right? So they go get this thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, here's where we need to pay attention. All right? They're going to move. David believes he is trying to do this for God, just like Mike believed he was trying to get the right stuff here for God. David's intentions are all good. He's working at this. So he goes to get this thing. Now, they go get it. They get it loaded, and I don't know how they got it loaded. I don't understand that, but that's neither here nor there. All right, they set this Ark of the Covenant, which is a box, all right, gold plated, gold covered. They set this thing on a cart, all right, and they start up the road with it. Now, when they set it on this cart and they start up the road, everybody's dancing and praising the Lord, and this is wonderful. All right, up the road we go. Now, there's a guy walking beside it whose name is Uzzah. Uzzah, Uzza, U-Z-Z-A-H. We'll say Uzzah, Uzzah. All right, anyhow. He's walking beside it. They're walking up the road, hits the bump in the road, and this thing shifts. This guy lays his hand on it to keep it from falling off, and God takes him out of the world just like that. Boom, he's gone immediately. Okay? And see what happened there? All right? There was no stop thinking about this. This guy was gone. David looks around and don't know what to do. You know? Everything's going good here. We're working at this. But what happened here is they got turkey burger instead of hamburger. Mm -hmm. All right? We'll talk about that in just a second. This guy leaves the world. All right? Now, take your Bible and look at verse number uh, 6. We're in chapter 6, verse number 6. And when they came to Nachon's threshing floor, Yusa put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Yusa, and God smote him there for his, for his error, and there he died. By the heart of God. Right? Now, right here was a sin of disobedience, and this man was chastised for it. That's what happened right here. Okay? David looks around at him, and the man's dead. Now look at verse number eight. And David was displeased. Look at verse number nine. And David was afraid. David didn't know what to do. Okay? Now, what we need to stop and think about here for just a minute. Well, that little piece of paper that I gave you all. In the book of Numbers, chapter number 4, it's in the first 15 verses, God explains to the people of Israel exactly how he wants this thing handled, how to move it, who moves it, what to do with it, specific instructions. All right? David got in a hurry, or didn't think it was important, the same way Mike brought the turkey burger, David got in a hurry didn't do it as God told him to do it, and he was, this man was chastised for it, okay? That's what we need to remember, all right? Let's stop right here. When they move this thing, now remember this. When they move this, what it's going to tell you in the book of Numbers is, first of all, we're talking about a box. So big, so big, so big. And this is the holiest thing there is on the earth at this particular time, okay? Nobody got to see this thing. The only person that ever saw it was the high priest who went in once a year. These people weren't even allowed to look at it. All right? Now they got it out in the middle of the road hauling it on a cart. 
Okay? What you're supposed to do with this, first of all, is cover it. That's what it says. Next thing you're supposed to do with it is you're supposed to put staves in the sides of it, in the rings. These guys carry it on the shoulders like this. You don't touch it, all right? It's covered. And it goes to the point where God says specifically who's supposed to carry it, okay? The Levites are supposed to carry it who are of the family of Kohath, K-O-H-A-T-H, okay? That's who's supposed to carry this thing. Now, what happens is this guy dies. There they all stand, and nobody knows what to do. So David says, all right, take it. And it just happens that this happens in front of some guy's house. This would be like this going down the road right here in the front of Joey Dunn's house and all this happened, this calamity. Well, there they stand. There's this guy's house. David said, take it over and put it in that house. And we'll figure out what to do. We'll come back and get it. That's what he tells me. Okay. Now, the interesting thing here is, and this, this is interesting. The interesting thing here is the man that lives in that house, his name is Obed Edom. That's his name. Right? And it just so happens that he is a Levite of the family of Kohath. Okay? See how God worked that? Here's a guy who is actually supposed to be taking care of this thing. Okay? So now they take it over to his house. All right? Obed Edom, he is one of the sons of Kohath. Okay? Now, and you have to stop and think. God brought this Ark of the Covenant through the Philistines, it's set out in the field, it's set in somebody's barn, you know, and finally he has got, this is the sovereignty of God, this thing didn't just happen to happen in front of this guy's house by choice, okay? God is bringing this ark to Jerusalem and he wants David to take care of it, okay? So, to take it over to this guy's house, all right? Now, watch this, look at verse number 12, look at verse number 11. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom to get tight three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Okay? See, I, this is what you were talking about a minute ago. This guy, his household was blessed because this was doing it correctly. This is the way God wanted it done. This man was actually qualified to handle the same. Okay? Now we're doing it right, and God will bless you because of it. Okay? That's what's getting ready to happen. Look at verse number 12. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertained unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. Now, we're doing it right. Okay? We're following the instructions that God gave them to do. Thank you, Bibles. Turn back to 1 Chronicles. Back to 1 Chronicles, we want to look at verse number uh, chapter 15. Chapter 15, verse number 2. Chapter 15, verse number 2. Then David said, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. For them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. Now David is doing it correctly. Okay? He's got slowed down here. He figured out what the problem is, and now he's doing it right. Look at verse number 15. And the children of the Levites bear the ark of God upon their shoulders with the staves thereon, as Moses commanded, according to the word of the Lord. Now they're following the instructions. Okay, Go down to verse number 26. And it came to pass, when God helped the Levites, that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Not only was God going to bless these people because they were doing it correctly, right? He's helping them. He said, okay, now you're going to do this like I told you to do it. I'll help you. If you go buy a hamburger and leave the turkey burger alone, God will help you and will bless you, right? Okay? Anytime that he gives us something to do, he's always with us, right? He will make sure we have the tools to do it with, and he will help us through it. Okay? That's what's going on here. It came to pass when God helped the Levites to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord that they offered seven bullocks and seven rings. Go back to 2 Samuel. Back to 2 Samuel. Chapter number 6, verse number 13. 
chapter 6, verse number 13. Watch this. These guys pick this thing up. Now think about this a minute. The last guy to touch this thing is dead. Okay? So these guys are picking this thing up very gently. Right? They get it up on the shoulders like this. Okay? And it said, God help them. Right? Now, they go one, two, three, four, five, six. And David says, Stop right there. Right? They walk six steps. Stop right there. On the seventh step, you see down in verse number 13. And it was so when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed all, he sacrificed oxen and fat. They didn't even get seven steps. They said, whoa, we're doing good here. Stop right there. And they sacrificed to the Lord. Okay? Now, they are doing these things correctly, and God is blessed them for Take your Bibles and go to Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah. We want to look at chapter number 7. Chapter 7, verse number 23. Chapter 7, verse number 23. This is God speaking. It says, But this thing commanded I then say, Obey my voice. Okay? <laughs> Obey my voice. No turkey bird. We're talking hamburger. Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people, and walk ye in all the ways. That's all. Uh -huh. That's not turkey burgers. That's hamburger. Walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well to you. There's the blessings, right? We will receive these blessings from God. We, re we will receive God's help. He'll help us with it as long as we obey Him completely, okay? What we want to take away from this, you go back to 2 Samuel, what we want to take away from this is the fact that there is nothing too small for us to say, this doesn't really matter, all right? When God gives us instructions, we need to follow them to the letter. All right? Okay. Good. You got any questions? Everybody good so far? How you doing, man? You okay? Uh, hang in there. We'll be done a little bit. Uh, all right. There are some things in our Bible, sets of Scripture, things that happen in our Bible that we don't really talk about. You know, we, we know them and we think we know them, but it's not something that is part of our conversation every day, like salvation and resurrection and those kind of things. But we need to know them and we need to understand them. We need to, we need to make sure we understand what this is about and what's going on here, okay? And that's what we're getting ready to talk about for a minute. What we're going to talk about is God's covenant with David. In your Bibles there somewhere, it should say the Davidic Covenant. You should see that in there. That's what we're getting ready to talk about. Now, what we want to understand here is we're going to talk about things that God promises David. Here's what I'm going to do for you. Okay? That's where we're headed. Now, they get the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem and get it situated, and they got it set in a tent out there somewhere. David says, you know, we need to build a house for that. I'm going to build a house for God. That's what David says. That's what the Bible says. I'm going to build a house for God. He goes to Nathan. Nathan is one of David's closest advisors. Right? Nathan is a prophet. Nathan talks to God. Okay. Now, David goes to Nathan and says, so here's what I'm getting ready to do. Nathan says, I think it's a fine plan. If that's what's on your heart, have at it. Okay? Now, they missed something here. They missed, they missed, they missed a step. All right? That night, God comes to Nathan and says, Whoa, whoa, we're not doing that. What are you thinking about? Okay? God says, Absolutely not. Now, God also, and you get the impression from reading this, it's like, you know, I appreciate the thought, but that's not what we're going to do. Okay? He tells Nathan, he says, You go tell David, and then he gives him the things that he wants David to do. Okay? Now remember, God told David, no, you're not going to build this house. All right? And there are reasons for it. And we'll get into that later on. But God said, no, 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 no. Hang on. Now remember, David went after him. When David decided to do this, here's another instance of 
He had the best intentions in the world. I mean, he was trying to glorify God. I'm going to build him a house, you know? He was trying to do the right thing. God said, no, that's no, we're not doing that. Now, look at verse number, let me get caught up here. Look at verse number 11, we're in chapter 7. Verse number 11. Chapter 7, verse number 11. Now remember, God just told David, no, you're not going to build me a house, okay? Then he says, verse number 11 says, And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. God just told David, you're not going to make me a house. I'm going to make you a house. That's what's actually going to happen here. Okay? Now here's the first thing we need to understand. When God tells David, I'm going to make you a house, he is not talking about a house, right? We're not talking about a physical structure here, okay? That's not what, that's not what God is telling us. God is talking about the house of David, right? Which is David, Solomon, his descendants, his lineage, and one of the words that they use a lot is his dynasty, okay? His descendants, that's what we're talking about. Now, keep in mind, now think about this, Saul was cut off, okay? When Saul turned from God, God cut Saul off. When he died, Jonathan died, that was the end of Saul's house, okay? See what I'm talking about? Right there is where it stopped. It should have been Saul, Jonathan, his son, his son, the next son, his son, all right? That's what we're talking about here with David, okay? Saul's house was cut off, right? Now we're talking about David's house, his lineage and his descendants, okay? All right, watch what he says. Verse number 12, and when, what you want to watch here in these next three or four verses, watch how many times God says, I will, okay? These are promises that God is making to David. I will, I will, I will, and I will, okay? Verse number 12 says, and when, the, when thy days be fulfilled, Thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. I will set up thy seed after thee, who shall proceed out of the bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. We're talking about Solomon now, okay? His kingdom, his kingdom, David's kingdom, we're talking about Israel, okay? You with me so far? Okay? And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. Solomon's going to build a temple. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom. Now watch this, forever, all right? Now we're talking about forever. This is not the next hundred years. This is forever, okay? Verse number 14, I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the children of men. Now watch, verse 15, but my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. What God is telling David here, we'll look at this next verse. God is telling David no matter what happens, no matter how bad it gets, no matter what occurs, okay, your house will continue forever. You will not be cut off, okay, like Saul was. Now, look at verse number 16. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee, thy throne shall be established forever. Thy house, thy kingdom, this is David's lineage, this is his descendants, this is his house, this is the kingdom of Israel shall be established forever. Okay? You with me? I'm getting a lot of like, my kids. All right? You with me? All right, let me, let's look at some verses. Take the Bible. Look at, uh, back to Jeremiah. Go back to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23. Back to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23. Verse number 5. Book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, verse number 5. Got it? It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord. Now watch this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David 
I will raise unto David a righteous branch, a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. You understand here that we're, we're moving from David, the throne of David, the kingdom, we're moving to Jesus Christ. That's where we're headed. That's where all this is going. That's what this covenant is about. It's about Christ. Okay? It says, and I will raise unto David a righteous branch and a king. All right, turn back to the book of Isaiah. Back to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 9. Book of Isaiah, chapter number 9. Look at verse number 6. Chapter 9, verse number 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, this is Jesus Christ we're talking about. Yes. Verse number 7 says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David. Yep. See that? Yeah. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order and to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. The throne of David. Look here. Jesus Christ is set in heaven right now mm -hmm. on throne of David. Okay? That's what the forever is we're talking about. God promised him in this covenant forever. Right? Your throne will go forever. Your kingdom forever. Right? Turn to the book of Luke. Turn to the book of Luke. Look at chapter number one. Look at chapter number one, verse number 32. No, verse number 31. We'll start with that. Luke chapter 1, verse number 30. Verse number 31. It says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Okay? Alright, now go back to the book of Matthew, where I'm about to come here. Book of Matthew, chapter number one, verse number one. It says, "The book of the generations of Je the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the Son of David." Okay, now look here. That's what this covenant is talking about. God is making these promises to David about these scriptures that we just looked at, all right? We're talking about David's house, David's lineage, David's throne. All comes together at Christ. There was a commentator that I was reading this week, who, and this makes sense, kind of. He said, David's throne, David sat on it, right? Solomon sat on it, okay? Now, what happened next was Rehoboam and the kingdom splits. The next king to set on David's throne was Jesus Christ when they crowned him with the crown of thorns. Okay? See how that works? Even though it came apart, even though it was covered up with sin in there, because of God's promises to David, Jesus Christ set on David's throne. Alright? Okay. Let's not take a break for just a minute. You did that? That is something, like I say, that's not something we talk about on a regular basis, but we need to understand that. That's something we need to know. Now, here we go. Let's finish up. Let's look at what David did. Go back to uh, 2 Samuel. We are in chapter number 7, verse number 18. Chapter 7, verse number 18. Here we go. It says, Then went King David in and set forth the Lord. All right, see that? Then went King David in and set before the Lord. Bible scholars believe that what happened here is David went into the tent where the Ark of the Covenant was, walked up to it, and sat down. All right? If that's true, now what David does here is he offers God prayers of thanksgiving and praise. If that's true, if he went in before the Ark of the Covenant and sat down, he's the only man that ever did that. All right? Nobody else could do it. When the high priest went in there, they had to go in with blood for their sacrifice. David goes in 
sits down and begins to talk to God. He was the only man ever allowed to do that with the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? Okay, we are just about finished. Now, what you want to think about, here we go, what you want to think about and what you want to get from this, now let me see if I can say this. David is in, in David's relationship with God right now, where he is right now, is about as good as it is humanly possible to be. Does that make sense? All right? And what we want to think about is where David, David's relationship with God right now is what we're working towards. That's where we want to be. Right where David is right now. Everything is going great for David. You read on in those next couple of chapters, it says, and the Lord protected David. The Lord preserved David. David dedicated everything he did to the Lord. David knew that everything he had was because of God. He knew that all his blessings came from God. Okay? He is where we want to be. Okay? Okay. What happens next is David makes two or three very bad decisions. He makes some mistakes. Bad ones. Okay? And what's going to happen is God's going to forgive him. God still loves him. Because of this covenant, he's not going to be cut off. But he will never get this relationship back. Okay? He tries, and he comes close, but he will never get back to this point in his relationship with God because of the mistakes that he made. He makes bad decisions. Right? Okay. Man, that wasn't too bad, was it? <laughs> good, good, good. We're done. That's that takes care of that. Now, let me tell you what's next. Alright? You ready? We're not gonna be here next week. I'm not gonna be here next week. We're going to the mission. Corey is gonna get to tell you all about Bathsheba. Alright? Which is I think that's going to be great. <laughs> uh, the scriptures for next week. We'll write this down someplace. Scripture for next week. 2 Samuel, chapter number 11. This is lesson number 9 in your Sunday school book. 2 Samuel, chapter number 11, verse number 1, through chapter 18, verse number 33. That's a lot. That's a lot of material. Uh, memory verse is Psalm 51, verse 10. Now, let's take just a minute. Here. We're going to go. First of all, you got any questions? Anything we need to talk about? Is everybody good? Okay. Uh, how many of you can say, I'm caught up in my Bible reading? Come on, Corey. How many of you can say, I'm caught up? I'm up to speed right here. All right. That would have been a nobody. <laughs> All right, we need to work on that. You know, we need to we need to stay up. there. this is a lot of reading. This next section here, you're talking about seven chapters, but that's chapter a day. That's not a problem. No, it's not. We gotta stay caught up. Gotta stay with it. Okay. Anything else? Anybody? Let my mouth walk and find the meat later. <laughs> <laughs> was interesting and when I was thinking about the, the interesting part about that I guess is how there are a lot of small things that God tells us to do that we think I got it I'll take care of that yeah. and it doesn't work it, that doesn't work All right? anybody else you see that example throughout the Old Testament where the children of Israel uh, when they came into the land the promised land the heathen worshipped in the high places that was their effort by their works trying to get to God. And then as you find the children of Israel later on, they constantly, as they were worshiping God, they were worshiping him in the high places. And that was a symbol of the compromise. And that's, that's a picture, too, of what happens oftentimes at the church where we incorporate the world's methods trying to worship a holy God. And it just doesn't work that way. You know, one thing that I have noticed here, and, and I knew this, and I know that you all knew this, but it's something that we need to be reminded of, we need to think about. God is very particular 
Mm-hmm. Okay? Yep. There's no halfway doing it. I'm going to do this. I got this. You take care of that. I'll take care of it. No, 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 no. We, think, we talk about the sovereignty of God. We talk about the fact that God is in control. Well, if he's in control, he, he's either is in control or he's not. And we believe that he is. That means that he's in control of everything. We need to just be reminded of that from yeah. time to time. Okay? Anybody else? Hi, right, Craig. You want to pray? We'll be done. You know, just say for his good son, his name is come out here, Lord, and hear your word talk to us, dear Lord. Remember always, dear Lord, talk about Jesus Christ, talk to us in the Bible, dear Lord. Just like, you know, see and learn about that, dear Lord. And there's one here in Old Navy that comes next one to two later. Yes. Dear Lord, throughout the rest of the service today, we've got a great Thank you, Craig.